Welcome to the Kriya Yoga Podcast, a source of inspiration and actionable education for those inspired towards the goal of enlightenment through yogic meditation. Through these interviews, discussions, and reflections, it is my intention to share the possibility of waking up to the reality of self and God realization, and to remind you of the immortal words of Paramahansa Yogananda. Don't look back. Don't look to the left or to the right. Look straight ahead to the goal and go all the way in this lifetime. I'm Ryan Kurzak, and I'll be your host on this adventure of spiritual self-discovery. Okay, welcome everyone to our May Kriya Yoga Sunday service. Um, today, we're going to be talking about how to develop spiritual strength, spiritual strength and spiritual power. Um, before we get into that, I do have a, a few announcements. Uh, first of all, uh, those of you who are interested in participating in the Kriya Yoga Apprenticeship Program, the two-year Kriya Yoga Apprenticeship Program that was uh, developed between myself and Mr. Davis, uh, applications for that are due in October. And there are a few requirements that you have to meet before applying, such as meditating for six months and so on, and also taking a few preliminary classes. So if you're interested in participating in that, I would encourage you to start thinking about that now. Um, we also, <clears throat> we only accept 25 students a year so that we have a little more time together as we go through the program. So I wanted to put that out there. Um, if you're interested in supporting this Kriya Yoga teaching ministry, or you want to take some beginner or intermediate classes, you can go to patreon.com slash Kriya Yoga for the Kriya Yoga online Patreon community. Um, we just had a wonderful retreat last weekend. There are about 14 of us that met here in the small town of Fairmont, West Virginia. And we've been discussing doing um, regular monthly uh, meetings because a lot of people can drive in from, say, Maryland or uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and so on. So we'll see how that goes. And in June, we're not going to be having a Kriya Yoga Sunday service because June is the online solstice retreat, the four-day online solstice retreat. So I'd like to encourage you to participate in that. And if you can't do all four days, you can at least participate in the weekend. And if you can't do that, you can participate in the two-hour um, meditation for the solstice, which will happen at 8 a.m., uh, but this will be listed on the Kriya Yoga Alliance website as well as at kriyogaonline.com. All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. So today we're going to be talking about spiritual strength, spiritual power, how to develop these things. And I talk about this a lot. So some of you might be somewhat familiar with the approach we're about to take here. Um, in the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, there's a section, the third section, which deals with spiritual powers, soul powers, uh, the cities. And many people look at these as though they are magical qualities that you develop through your devoted practice. But the cities and the soul powers are really things that are available to you so that you can navigate your spiritual path well. That's the whole point of the, the cities and the soul powers. And one of my favorite soul powers is the one that describes friendship. So this is Sutra uh, 23 in chapter three of the Yoga Sutras. It says, Maitri Deshu Balani, which essentially means by contemplating, by engaging the power of friendship one develops spiritual strength. So by contemplating, by engaging the power of friendship, one develops spiritual strength. And it goes on to say in um, Sutra 24, uh, Baleshu Hasti Baladini, which means by focusing on contemplating that strength that develops from, from, from friendship, one essentially has the power of an elephant, the strength of an elephant. And when we're thinking about these sutras, we, we have to pull it apart a little bit from the Sanskrit. The word that's used for friendship is Maitri. And Maitri 
that's a name. You can call someone that. It, it means divine friend. And the word Maitri is very similar, and it also has a similar kind of uh, derivation from the word metta. And in Buddhism, we know that there's an emphasis put towards uh, benevolence and loving kindness and friendliness and so on. Well, this sutra is essentially telling you that by, from a yogic perspective, by contemplating friendship, you become spiritually strong. And like all things in the yoga sutras, we have to remember that this is a, uh, this is a, a small phrase of a few words and the yoga sutras are jam packed with information in just 195, 196 sentences. And so within that small phrase, there's a lot. That word friendship doesn't just simply mean being nice to your neighbors. It doesn't simply mean just having compassion when you see suffering in others. That phrase by meditating on, and the word is actually sanyama, by practicing sanyama on friendship, one develops spiritual strength. It means developing friendship with all levels of your consciousness and your being. And it's easy to radiate that friendship out to others, that compassion, that goodwill, that love out to others. Well, in, in theory, it's good. It's easy to do that. We, we should be doing that as yogis. Um, but this really needs to be taken internally for ourselves because we, we become interested in meditation sometimes because we are deeply inspired to know God. That's one of the ways that we get drawn towards meditation. And many of you might say that that's the reason you were drawn towards meditation. But most people are drawn towards meditation or spiritual paths because they hurt, because they are uncomfortable in the world, because they experience anxiety, because they've been traumatized and so on. And usually that's probably the real reason most people are drawn towards spiritual practices, because if you think about it, religion and spirituality is, is, is for those who need um, to know their, their, their inner well-being. I was talking to a friend of mine who I play music with, and he's a, a Orthodox um, Eastern Orthodox uh, Christian of some sort. And I'm, I'm not really up on how all those things work, but he was talking to me and he was describing that according to his system of theology and belief is that the church isn't supposed to correct sin or it's not supposed to you know, punish people for sin. He says the church is supposed to be like a hospital that you come to the church so that whatever wounds you have are healed so that you can live. And so sin in a sense is just being wounded. And that really stuck with me, that idea of, um, of you know, it's not about sin, it's not about these kinds of things, it's about he healing our inner wounds so that we can live freely. And this, this particular suture on friendship if you were able to make peace inside with yourself, if you were able to make friends with yourself and all the different parts of you, you would be freer and happier. And then it would be more likely that when you do explore things like spirituality and meditation, you will, you will know what Yogananda knew. You will know what the saints and the sages knew because often we forget that our meditation practices are tools. And Yogananda had said this. He said that you, you use the tools, but then when you're done with the tools, you put them down. And in a way, uh, this came to me while I was meditating this morning. It's like when you learn meditation, what you've learned to do is you've learned how to use a hammer and you've learned how to use a nail. And so you can put boards together. And what most of us do is we run around just hammering nails into boards. And we totally forget the fact that the reason we learn how to hammer nails into boards is so that we can build a house, so that we can live in a house, so that we can have protection, so that we can not be concerned about the elements. And the, the process of meditation is just like that. So when you meditate, 
when we think about this particular sutra, there's a reason the sutra was put in that Patanjali thought this was so important. It's, it's one of the most important sutras in the chapter on soul powers and cities, because he's telling you, you have to be on friendly terms with yourself and with the world and with the people around you. And so this is why there is an emphasis in Buddhism on compassion and loving kindness. This is why when people attend to their, their inner well-being psychologically, they find that meditation is not just something that you do as a discipline to force yourself into it because an authority told you it was important or because you, know, you have these, these, uh, this cognitive dissonance in your mind. And so this is a, a, an acceptable way for you to kind of uh, resolve that, you know, some people can go out drinking, some people can go out dancing, some people can be addicted to this or that. Well, meditation is a very acceptable way of managing your, your distress because you're not hurting anybody and you're sitting still and people like that, but that's not really the point of meditation. So what I'm trying to get at here is that when you sit to meditate, one of the best things you can do to develop spiritual strength is start cultivating or wondering how you can cultivate um, benevolence, loving kindness, friendliness, goodwill. And you need to start with yourself. You need to start with yourself. And how do you do that? Well, there's something we need to consider here. Many people uh, experience psychological and emotional distress. And sometimes it becomes so consistent that they don't even really, they just think it's normal. Uh, there've been so many family members and friends that I've talked to that just tell me that them and their kids are all on antidepressants. So many people, it blows my mind. I'm thinking, wow, how, why is, how is that even possible? And I think about their kids and how young they are. I'm like, why are, why are all these people so medicated? Well, the reason that's the case is because for whatever reason, they feel anxiety or depression or sadness, and they don't remember why they feel it. Now, I didn't say they don't know why they feel it. I said they don't remember why they feel it. And the reason I say that is because you feel the way you do for a very valid reason. You behave the way you do, even if it's not helpful, if you binge and you purge or you do this or you do that, that's not helpful for you, or you go you know, splurging with your credit card and so on, or you yell at your spouse or you become uh, internally withdrawn and so on. You do that for a very good reason. You don't remember why, but there was a point in time in your life, usually probably when you were a child, that that served you, it protected you, it kept you safe, it kept you alive. Now, we're not going to get into all the, the, the psychological dynamics. We don't have time for that. But I just want to encourage you to think about this. And so if that is the case, that there is a very real reason that you can't sit in meditation and be calm because you're distracted by this or that, or there's a very real reason that you are not inspired or that you have a lot of sense of grief and so on, uh, assuming that there's not an active difficulty going on because sometimes life is just happening. We're talking about those times where you don't really know why, where you don't remember why. We have to remember that there is a part of you that that was a survival mechanism. And that part of you is the part to make friends with, to have compassion for rather than use your meditation technique like everyone else does. This is the reason there are not very many enlightened people, but there's a heck of a lot of meditators. <laughs> the reason there, there are a lot of meditators, but not very many enlightened people is because most people treat meditation just as one more way to shut that kid up who's crying inside because you don't want to hear it, because you don't want to go back and have a sense of love and compassion there. And you get really good at it. And you can, you, can, you can shut it down and you can meditate and you can say, oh, I'm so poised. And then you go back out into the world and you wonder, why does it come right back? Why doesn't meditation work long-term? When, when you do meditation well, it, it works long-term, meaning you go and you meditate and you feel clear and it stays that way. You go and you meditate and you feel clear and you feel connection to spirit. 
if that's not what's happening to you, usually probably what you're doing within your meditation practice is you are just repressing all the voices inside, all the, all the parts of you that, that you don't have the energy or time to deal with, and you need to. So you can begin by when, when, you, when you recognize this, just wonder, how can I have a sense of love and compassion for myself? If there's grief in there, how can I give that grief space and love it and be present with it? When there's anxiety in there, wonder how can I, how can I allow that to not take over your life? We're not encouraging you to be dominated by these things, but you do need to attend to them. And when you do, when you begin developing daily the sense of love and compassion and friendliness towards yourself, instead of trying to just control yourself or discipline yourself or beat yourself down, that was the patriarchal way of doing it. And we saw what we we see what that does to people in societies. We are now looking within and we're using our meditation techniques to, to become calm and relaxed as that's the purpose of meditation techniques and to go within. And then if we experience a sense of divine communion, wonderful, go with it, feel it, be present with it, breathe through it. But if we become more aware, if we become more aware of a part of us, which we are not necessarily willing to, uh, we, we've ignored or which troubles us, take a moment and just step back and imagine that you are like a ball of loving kindness. And if you were around another person who was experiencing that kind of sensation, what would, how would you be with them? You would, how would you be a presence for them? And what you might find is that if you do this and you make this part of your inner work day after day, you are actually truly going to feel clear, more loving, more connected, and have a deeper sense of communion with the wholeness of life. And that is the whole purpose of spirituality. That's the whole purpose of this whole process. It's, it's sometimes difficult, but again, if you can be patient with yourself, you will find that those changes occur and, and they are lasting. Yogananda, he once said that true self-analysis is the greatest art of progress. True self-analysis is the greatest art of progress. What does that mean? Well, it speaks to what we've been talking about here, that we don't want to turn our, our meditation into a mechanical experience where all we're doing is we've got a hammer and we've got nails and there's a board. Let's just keep hammering nails into the board. We want to realize that the purpose of the hammer and the nail, the meditation technique is again, to build a house, to build your spiritual home, to build spiritual strength for yourself. And once you have it for yourself, you can share it with others, but it always really needs to start with you. And so your meditation practice needs to be more alive and dynamic, not, so, not just something that you think, I can't wait to meditate so that I can forget the world. Don't think like that. <laughs> that's, 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 a repressive, that's a repressive mentality. You think, let's go into meditation so I can become stronger so that I can be more present, so that I can be more alive, so that I can embody a sense of loving compassion in all experiences. Because here's the beautiful thing. Once you begin to practice what it says in um, Sutra 23 of chapter three, contemplation, focusing on friendship, gives spiritual strength. Once you start to practice that, not only do you actually feel spiritually alive and clear and happy, not, not, not happy. Like you've just taken a bunch of drugs, happy, but like a real sense of deep contentment. Well, then what happens is when you are interacting with the world, there is a greater sense of friendship. There is a greater sense of community. There is a greater sense of calmness, of clarity. There's a greater sense of wisdom, of appropriateness, of truth, which means when you are around someone else who is suffering or hurt, you don't immediately judge them. You, you treat them the same way you would treat yourself, which would be this person is behaving like this for a reason. They don't remember why. And I don't know why, but I'm going to be a presence in their life, assuming that they're not being abusive. We're not saying to remain in abusive relationships because sometimes you just got to get out of those. But when you're around someone who is hurting, just like you hurt, they're going to behave in ways that are not, that you don't like that most people don't like, but they're not behaving in that way just to get on your nerves. They're behaving in that way because they themselves have aspects of them, which have not been honored, loved, 
felt made to feel safe and have compassion. That's why we have all these problems in the world. We think it's, you know, politics and whatnot, but it all boils down to this inability to experience um, love and compassion for ourselves and others. Right. That's why we have bullying. That's why um, recently I, I was working on uh, an advanced manual for um, uh, people who complete the, the Kriya Yoga apprenticeship course. And um, <clears throat> there was a lot of stuff that needed edited. And so I, I contacted a, a dear friend of mine, see if she would help me edit it. And she wrote back and apologized. She, she said, you know, I, I hope I didn't upset you. And I had to, I said to her, I said, look, I am actually my biological age, <laughs> which means you can, you can give me criticism and 44 year old Ryan as an adult will understand that that's just part of being alive. And I asked you to help me. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because I'm sure that person probably had experienced individuals who are my, my age or older that become offended or become all puffed up and proud, you know, if you kind of give them any kind of advice or, or try to um, talk to them in a way that's meaningful, that, that, that offends them. If, if, we ha if we had been able to take time to have compassion for ourselves and others, but really more so compassion for ourselves, uh, those issues wouldn't come up. People who are 45, 60, 70, they would not behave like little narcissistic children they would be adults. And in order to become a spiritual adult, we have to do what Yogananda says, which is what? Practice true self-analysis. Practice true self-analysis. And that includes this idea of regular introspection. And Paramahansa Yogananda, he would say, most people essentially become psychological antiques. They be, are you, so the question is, are you a psychological antique? And what would make you a psychological antique? A psychological antique would be someone who never grows up. A psychological antique <clears throat> would be someone who never practiced um, self-analysis. A psychological antique is a person who lives the same way every day and never takes into consideration the fact that the world is always changing, that situations are always changing. <clears throat> and this applies to not just to ourselves, but also to our spiritual paths. You know, many people think that, um, for example, uh, the way Yogananda taught and the way he saw the world, that, that we, should, we should continue to sort of mimic that when we forget <clears throat> that he was speaking to a particular population of people in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, it was a whole different mentality. Now, of course, the core teaching is very essential, like that's not going to change, but how it's delivered changes, just like Roy Jean Davis did things differently than um, Yogananda, and Yogananda did things differently than uh, Swami Sri Yukteswar, not in the essence of the teaching, but in the essence of how it was delivered. And so we don't want to become psychological antiques ourselves, but we also don't want to become trapped in uh, sort of uh, spiritual paradigms, which were more appropriate to another time, right? And how do you do that? You pay attention. You go into the world and you have to be brave. You have to be brave because when you go into the world, with the purpose of being alive, then you're also vulnerable. You are also sensitive. And so we have to learn to be alive and sensitive to life versus doing what a psychological antique would do, which would be what? Just simply focus on the past of how things used to be without any kind of change. And they become like a shell, a husk. And when you are a shell or a husk, well, you're a lot safer because a husk is hard, which means the world can't touch you and you can't touch the world. And part of this idea of spiritual strength and friendship is that when you are friends with something or someone or yourself, you don't mind the pain of growing. You don't mind the occasional difficult exchange 
because you know that it's just communication and that sometimes misunderstanding isn't really a problem. It's just part of the growth process. And so when you have a friendship, a real friendship with someone, you grow together, you challenge each other, you become better. So I want to encourage you to become your own friend and practice your own self-analysis and ask yourself, how can I go into the world, even though I'm, I'm going to be a little vulnerable and I'm going to be a little more sensitive, but how can I go into the world with, with a sense of bravery and strength so that I am dynamically alive and that I bring love into the world because love is dynamic. It's not a husk and love is sensitive. It's not hard. And here's the thing. Most people don't like doing that because they don't, they haven't learned that it's, it's okay. And what you find is the more you give yourself permission to go into life that way, and to treat yourself with that same kind of uh, respect and again, compassion, what happens is the more you do it, the easier it is. And you, you're not bothered by the sensitivity of things. You're not bothered by the vulnerability. You just recognize this is just part of being alive. And when you give yourself permission to have that kind of bravery and that kind of strength, the, the friendship, the love, the compassion that potentially is encouraging you to, to cultivate really makes you feel strong. It's like um, a person, if we think about musicians, there are two kinds of musicians. There's one musician who memorizes a part, uh, just memorizes exactly how it goes or has a piece of sheet music and can't deviate from that sheet music, has to play it exactly like that person has been told every single time for years and years and years. And there's another kind of musician who's alive with the music. They get up on stage or they're performing or they're with their friends and they know how the music's supposed to go. They see the structure, but they're able to take chances. They're able to experiment. And if they make a wrong note, it doesn't stab them through the heart like it does the other person. They just realize, well, that's part of the fun. And so they move on so that you can tell the difference because then their music becomes alive and dynamic. And this is the way I'm trying to encourage you to look at your life. You have your meditation practice, which does what? It calms you down. It balances uh, the energies within the body. It allows you to experience inner peace. That's one of the main goals. But it also opens up a space for you to be alive, which means it opens up a space for you to notice, well, today I actually feel a lot of sadness or anger or anxiety. And so in that space, you say to yourself, okay, let's, let's look at that. Let's see how we can bring some compassion to that for ourselves, how we can acknowledge that at some point in time, this was actually, this was actually something that protected us, which allowed us to survive. And when you can start looking at your internal dynamic, your internal self that way, you, you, you begin to feel more love. You begin to embody love. You have more energy. Uh, there's a book that I, I read recently called No Bad Parts. It's by a fellow named Richard Schwartz. Someone recommended it to me uh, actually on the YouTube channel. And I had it and I didn't look at it very much because I've read all kinds of psychology books and I didn't really think I really needed to read another one. And then another friend of mine wrote to me and said, have you read that yet? And I said, well, no, not yet. <clears throat> and, uh, I figured I'm kind of busy. So the chance of me sitting down to read it was unlikely. So I got it on audiobook, and uh, I like to bike. So I thought, well, when I'm biking, I'll put it in and I'll listen to it. And I was listening to that book and my jaw dropped just about every chapter. Cause I thought to myself, this is exactly what I've experienced that has made all the difference in my spiritual path. This person just took it and put it into a, a formula and, and put it into kind of like a structure. And I thought, if I was going to write a book on this stuff, that would have been it. <laughs> and so I was very happy to, to find that book. And I've recommended it to a lot of people. Um, and the whole purpose of the book is to go over what we've been talking about here. This idea that we need to make, we need to have compassion and love for ourselves. And that's really ultimately what's going to change our relationship to the world. And it's also ultimately the thing which will make our spiritual life blossom. And many of you know that my, my wife passed away um, in 2018 uh, after about a year and a half of a, a serious illness. 
And shortly after that, uh, my teacher and probably your teacher as well, Roy Eugene Davis passed away within nine months of each other. And a few other things occurred too. And that was absolutely devastating. And I can remember when Melissa was dying, she never, ever complained. And every single day she said, I wouldn't take back a minute. She always said that. And of course I didn't understand it because, well, I was going through my own grief, but finally I understood it because if she hadn't died <clears throat> and if Mr. Davis hadn't checked out when he did, I would have never been forced to go inside and look at all of this material. Why? <clears throat> Because up until that point in my life, <clears throat> what did I need? I had a, a, a partner that we had a, a wonderful, loving relationship with. We met when we were very young. We were both Kriya Yogis. I had a spiritual teacher that if I ever needed anything, I could just go to him and we'd have a discussion or I felt the sense of you know, connection with him. And so I, I didn't have any internal, nothing needed to change because all the support I needed was externally there. But once that was taken away, I had to learn how to have that support within myself. And so anyway, I went through this very extensive internal psychological process, <clears throat> which was very much uh, kind of encapsulated by what's in that book, um, No Bad Parts. And it was through that process that even though I'd been studying with Mr. Davis for 18 years, practicing Kriya Pranayama, I was a ordained teacher. I taught people Kriya Yoga. Um, and I, I thought to myself, wow, I'm, I'm really having a great spiritual life here. But then after all this difficulty happened, I was forced to do what Yogananda said, <clears throat> explore the self-analysis deeply and consistently over the course of many years. It wasn't just a quick thing. This was a long period of time and still going on. It was only once I did that, that I really felt like I understood what Yogananda was talking about what Mr. Davis was talking about, what Ramana Maharshi was talking about. It was by going through that process that meditation went from just hammering nails and saying, see what a good carpenter I am to actually recognizing, oh, so this is what it means to experience a Sabhikalpa Samadhi state. So this is what it means to experience a Nirbhikalpa Samadhi state. Because I, I was forced to look at and make friends with and to um, quit repressing all the stuff I was using spirituality to repress, I was able to let go of and change all these things so that energy became more available to me, inner energy, spiritual energy became more available to me. And meditation went from just simply holding out the world and holding out distractions so I could have a moment of inner peace to just having freedom in, in that space. And Mr. Davis one time, uh, probably about, a year before he passed, I had asked them, well, what do you do in meditation? What is your experience? And he said, oh, I think, you know, I, I really just roam around in the infinite. And I sort of thought I understood what he meant. But again, after going through this process, I understood what he meant because you can only roam around in the infinite, in, 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 in God, in infinite consciousness, when you've got the energy and the freedom and the space to do it. And if you don't have psychological uh, friendship inside, you're not going to have with anything else and you're going to remain trapped. So the whole purpose of this talk, and we'll move on to meditation here in just a moment. The whole purpose of this talk is to encourage you to really recognize that potentially in a very short phrase made an important distinction. And he pointed out that one of the greatest soul powers is compassion and friendship and goodwill. And that can only develop if you are able to cultivate it within yourself, towards yourself. And that will allow you to experience it, not just internally, but also externally, but it has to start with you, okay? And once you have that, then you have spiritual strength, the strength of an elephant. An elephant is unstoppable. Well, I mean, you can stop it, but you get the idea. Metaphorically, an elephant is unstoppable. <clears throat> and my experience was that, yes, as you go through a process like that, it is as if your inner spiritual life becomes unstoppable in a very positive, <clears throat> healthy, uh, supportive, dynamic way. 
So when we get done today, I'd like to encourage you to take some time to reflect upon what could this mean for you? How could you understand this and apply it? Don't think about just like in your meditation, apply it in your whole life. You can start with meditation, but how can you apply it in your whole life holistically on all levels? And if you feel that you're overwhelmed, that is understandable because a lot of stuff happens to us. And the more stuff that happens to us, being vulnerable in any way feels like the furthest thing that you ever want to do. So ask yourself, what can, how, what can I do for my life, which will give me a sense of space and safety um, so that maybe every now and then I can look at this and consider this and not feel overwhelmed. Or maybe you need assistance, you know, maybe you need to, to, to talk to someone to help you sort of manage that situation. But I guarantee you, if you do, you will know what Yogananda knew. You will know what Ramana Maharshi knew. And isn't that why we're doing this? Really, ultimately, at the end of the day, that is why we are doing this. And I want you to experience that. And all of the teachers of all lineages, of all traditions, want you to experience that. That's why these traditions exist. And it's very, very accessible to you. And you can also take some time to pray and request help, assistance, because we can't always do it by ourselves. I didn't do it by myself. I had help. Uh, there are many things I could approach on my own, but I had guidance. I had assistance. I had a mentor and so on. Um, and that made all the difference in the world. And it took a, a few tries to find the help that, that I needed in that situation. Um, but if you, if you are open to it, if you can pray for it, then you will find that um, you do find the energy and you do find the sense of safety. And then you will, you will really be over the moon related to your spiritual practice and, and, and in a way that is authentic uh, in a way that is not pretentious, in a way that is not you just pretending. Um, and you'll be over the moon in what it does for your life beyond just giving you um, people to share a similar, uh, like for example, a lot of people get involved in, in spirituality because they're alone. And so if they meet other people who like to talk about Yogananda or sit around and, and, and meditate, um, they feel better because they're not alone. Well, we're talking about going beyond that to where the spiritual practice doesn't matter if anyone else does it or not. If anyone else believes it or not, you end up feeling like you have a direct route, a direct connection to spirit. And when you have that, you don't ever feel alone. And then your, your spiritual organizations or your spiritual groups become really alive. You know, they move from that, again, neediness to not be alone to uh, uh, a hive, a spiritual, uh, a spiritual hive like bees with honey. The honey is actually there. It's not just bees wandering around, wondering where the honey is and distracting themselves by talking to each other. They see there is the honey and they're able to be nourished by it. And this ultimately is what you want. This is what we all want. This is what we're growing towards as human beings. That is the purpose of our life. That is the purpose of all human life. Um, so that said, Keep that in mind, spend some time contemplating that, figure out a way that you can maybe make this actionable for you. And um, we'll meditate together for about 25 minutes or so. And what I will say for those of you who might have a little more time, uh, if you want to discuss this more, or if you have uh, questions about this, um, many of you know this, but for people who are Patreon members and also students in some of my classes, after the Sunday service, I also have a Q&A session. Usually it's just for people in those classes. Um, but today I'd like to invite you, any of you who aren't a part of that, uh, to join us. And the way you would do that is simply log out of Zoom when we get done and then log back in using the exact same, uh, the exact same address. That'll take you right back to me at 10, 15 a.m. Eastern time. And usually uh, it's a Q&A session. So any questions you have, you can put in the chat box and we'll discuss them. Sometimes they take an hour. I've sat with people for two and a half hours going through questions. So it's a, it's a, today's the day to, to ask your questions if you need it. All right, let's meditate together. <laughs>